There's certain friendships that can only get forged in the midst of incredible sacrifice, incredible struggle, and incredible pain. And the challenge for some of us is this. We avoid all those things at all costs, and yet we still long for the friendships and the camaraderie that those situations provide. The reason you need to listen to today, it's going to be a challenging message, okay? You're not going to feel great walking away from here, all right? Just to forewarn you, all right? But the reason you need to listen is this. Some of what your heart longs for is what you see some other people have. This, This depth of friendship that goes beyond all situations, goes beyond all you know, circumstances, it's endured years and years and years, ups and downs, thick and thin. And you long for that in your heart, and yet you are not putting yourself in the situation where those kind of friendships get forged. You're intentionally avoiding those situations. And so I want to dive into a story of about the Apostle Paul because Paul had some very deep friendships. He also had um, some very deep friendships that, that turned away from him. And that made some of the friendships that stayed with him even more vital and even more valuable to him. And I want to look at this uh, part of this letter. It's called Philippians, and it's a letter that, church, that Paul wrote to the church In Philippi, that's where we get Philippians. Philippi is a coastal city, and it is kind of the beachhead, really, for when the gospel came to Europe, all right? So that's kind of the the background here. And we're going to read a few, uh, you know, sections of Philippians, of Paul's letter, and then we're going to read uh, in Acts, because if you didn't know, Acts uh, in the New Testament, it's the history book, and Acts is the history from the point in time where Jesus ascends to heaven all the way through, you know, how the church begins to spread throughout the world and throughout the Roman Empire specifically. And so all the rest of the letters of Paul and the the parts of the New Testament that are written, they, they line up under Acts somewhere in the timeline there. And so that's what you've got going on here. And so Philippians, this this letter that Paul writes. You can read in Acts chapter 16 where the church at Philippi kind of started. And Paul is writing back to this group. And so I kind of want to look at that. So Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 through 5, Paul starts his letter off and he says this. Every time I think of you guys, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard until now. And you know, he just says, guys, this is the tone of this letter. Over and over go through this letter, it's like, and it's so right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart. You're never very far away from my thoughts or my heart. He just calls them over and over again, like my dear brothers and sisters, my friends, my, you know, my my partner's in the gospel, and there's just this affection that comes off over and over and over again throughout this letter. And you kind of wonder, like, what is that about? Like, why is Paul, like, so affectionate with this group of people? It's almost like a mushy letter, which is not Paul's style. Uh, Paul's a hard-charging, you know, A-type we're going to take the hill. I, if you're with me, great, but I don't need you because God's telling me to go here, and here we go. And he's very direct, and he's very bold, and you'd have a hard time keeping up with him, and I would too. You would have a hard time putting up with him, and I would too. And yet, here's this soft guy that's like, wow, you guys, you've got my whole heart. I love you so much, and it... And, and it he calls back at this first part from the time where he first heard it until now. Like, you, you guys are at the very beginning. It's like, you remember where we started? You remember our friendships where we started? You remember how this all began? And that's what he's calling back to. So now we go to Acts chapter 16 because 
<clears throat> this is where it all began, in Acts chapter 16. And what he's remembering and what he's referring to as he's looking back and remembering their history is when did this thing start? When did this friendship start? When did this thing happen? And this is what happened. Paul, he has a deep desire to take the gospel to the Gentile world. And he thinks that God, he thinks like in his best planning at this moment in time, is I'm going to go to Asia. That's where, he says, this is where I'm heading. I'm heading to Asia. And it says in Acts chapter 16, literally, that the Spirit prevented him from going to Asia. Now, I don't know what happens there. I don't know. We don't have any better explanation than just that. The Spirit prevented me from going to Asia. It was crazy. I don't know what that situation was like. I don't know how the Spirit prevented it. But if you're Paul and you want to take the gospel to a group of people that don't know it and somehow the Spirit is preventing you, that's a pretty significant moment in your life. Because you're doing something that you obviously know God wants you to do in taking the gospel, and then God's saying, no, not here. Putting the wall up. So then Paul's like, where do I go now? And he has a vision of somebody in Macedonia saying, come, come to us. And Paul takes that as a sign from God to head. And when he heads that way, he lands in Philippi. All right? So just think, just the background here, the people of Philippi, they don't understand this, but Paul is on a mission, and he's in tune with what God wants him to do, and he's trying to go here, and God says, nope, that door's closed, and then God opens this door here. So Paul is not just on a mission, he not, doesn't just have a, you know, a self-assigned, hey, this is what I'm going to do. Now he's got the boldness of direction from God's Spirit and saying, hey, this is where I want you to go. And then he shows up and he does what he does in most places. He shows up and tries to find like a synagogue and kind of start talking about what he knows from Judaism and try to bridge that over into the gospel. And I don't think he could find a, a synagogue in Philippi. And so that's where we pick the story up. So I'm just going to read through Acts chapter 16. Here we go. On the Sabbath... We went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer. And we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshipped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household were baptized and she asked us to be her guest. If you agree that I'm a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. You know, here's this Paul. He shows up at this foreign place. And we're like, hey, where do we get started here? Like, I know, honestly, I know what that's like. I remember coming here. And it was, uh, it was February of 2000. Anybody in the Charlotte area of February of 2000? Okay. I've, I drove in, and I am supposed to be back at my job as a pastor in eastern North Carolina on Wednesday night. I drove in on Monday. On Tuesday, it started snowing. 18, 16 inches. Anybody remember that? Okay. I was, <laughs> I was uh, somewhere around W.T. Harris Boulevard, like, Driving, driving through Huntersville and driving through the university area and driving through uptown area. Literally, like, where, God, would you want us to start here? We had a group that wanted us to come here and start a church, and they kind of left it up to us as to where around 485, as it was planned at that point, to, to build. And I, so we came here and just, like, where do you start? Like, I don't know, I didn't know anybody. And it's really hard to be like, wow, like I've been to Charlotte one time in my entire life. And now, here we go. I feel like God's leading us here. Let's do this. And you just don't even know where to begin. And four months later, we moved our whole family here. Still kind of clueless. But we had a target. University area. Harrisburg. Here we go. And so Paul's going into the city. And then he finds a person. And, and they... She's a spiritual person. She's a follower of God. She just 
hadn't heard the news about Jesus Christ, hadn't heard of his death and resurrection. And so she receives that message and she's immediately baptized. Her and her household receives that message and they're baptized. And it's like, like for Paul, it's got to be like, wow, here we go. Like, this is why God wanted me here. It's, to me, it reminds me when I um, finished grad school and I actually moved to Williamston, North Carolina to be a pastor. And I've told some of you this story before, but two weeks after I moved in, okay, you finished grad school, you're ready to do the real deal here, right? Because you got all the credentials um, that don't mean that much. Um, but you feel like they do at the time. And so, so stay in school, keep, keep doing that, all right? Um, uh, and, but you're still like, man, what am I doing here? And two weeks, two weeks after I moved in to the day, a guy knocks on my door, he's 14 years old. He's like, I've been going to church a couple times, and I, I don't know. I don't get it. And I just, I, somebody told me, you're the pastor that just moved in. Tell me what this Jesus thing's all about. That's his literal words. And, you know, like for me, I was like, gotcha. Like, I'm good here. Like, I, I get it. You know, it's not too hard to connect the dots at that point between God wants me here. Somebody knocking on the door. Hey, can you tell me about this Jesus thing? That's how this, this situation had to be with Lydia and her whole family. For Paul, it's like, ah, like God said, don't go here, go here, and voila. And this is maybe who God wanted me to, you know, share the message with. And so the story continues. And one day we're going to a place of prayer right after this. And we met a slave girl. Who had, had, who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. And she earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. So she was their source of income. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God and they've come to tell you how to be saved. This went on day after day until Paul... <laughs> this is where I really like Paul. I think I, think I would really like Paul. This went on day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and he said to the demon within her, I've, I've put up with you for a few days now and it's about time that this is ending, okay? I'm commanding you in the name of Jesus to come out of her and instantly it left her. And I'm thinking, wow, like, there's that second big moment. But then what happens? I mean, look, he's just serving this girl, right? But look, when you serve people, it doesn't feel this way when you really serve people who are victims, okay? It upsets power structures that profit or benefit by keeping those people victims, okay? Don't be deceived into thinking that you can help people without upsetting and offending power structures, okay? You think it should be easy. Let's just be loving. Let's just love this world. Let's just love this community. And we will. And we'll continue to do it. And the deeper we go into raising up people who are, in, who are bound, whether physically or emotionally or spiritually, let me tell you, it upsets power structures. And you've got to deal with it. It's part of it. Don't be deceived. Listen, Jesus, he upset power structures. He was crucified because of it. Don't be deceived. Church, we are wise as serpents, harmless as doves. We are harmless in our love. Our mission is love. It will, if we are effective, upset power structures. And it will lead us to crucial decisions and this is what happens here so her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered so they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace the whole city's in an uproar because of these Jews they shouted to the city officials they're teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods all for just helping a girl They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. 
the jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. So around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and saying, I'm sure that's what I would be doing if I was beaten for no reason, thrown in the inner dungeon. I'd be singing and praying. God, you're so good. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you... No, I'm not sure I'd be at this point where they're at. But nevertheless, they are. And the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there's a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundation. All the doors immediately flew open. The chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoner had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself, because that's what was going to happen to him anyway. But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked them, sirs, what do I have to do to be saved? And the jailer, I'm sorry, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. And then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they had all believed in God. Now like when Paul's writing the letter of Philippians, he's referring back to this moment. And he's saying, hey, you remember these early days? And man, this was like, this is crazy time. I mean, you remember how we just kind of met Lydia and... Like you were there worshiping God and like I, here's the message. And then we, like this slave girl that we don't have her name but that freedom that she had. And then this event where people were against us but then the earthquake and then the jailer and now the whole family. And you know like that's all that Paul's like going through. Like whoo, wow. You remember those early days guys? Remember those early times? You've been with me from the very beginning. This next part is fabulous. This is where I love Paul. This is exactly what I would do. The next morning, the city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, hey, let those guys go. Because they're like, hmm. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said to you and Silas, are free to leave, go in peace. But Paul replied, they have publicly beaten us without a trial and put us in prison. And we're Roman citizens, so now they want us to leave secretly? Uh-uh. Certainly not. Let, let them come themselves to release us. I'm going to stay in here until they march their little butts down here and let us go. They shamed us publicly. Get a little taste of their own medicine here. When the police reported this, the city officials were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to the jail, apologized to them. Then they brought them out and begged them to leave the city. When Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia. There they met the believers and encouraged them once more. How, how much encouragement do you think those believers got from Paul's boldness? Because Paul's like, listen guys. Those city officials, like, they talk a good game, but they don't have anything on God. Don't worry about it. You might get thrown in prison, but God does earthquakes. Good. You know, like, you feel like his boldness, like, and he pulled them out. Like, I think it's Paul's, this moment might have given this new group of believers the boldness that they needed, the confidence and the courage they needed to say, hey, we can speak up in this city. And it's got a kind of a weird mix. It's this businesswoman, Lydia, who's got some, you know, oomph and some leadership because she's been running a business. You got this slave girl and then you got this jailer, you got this weird mix of people that come from all different backgrounds and yet they've received Christ and now they've got the boldness of knowing that here's Paul and Silas and they don't have any fear out of this officials or, or threats. 
It's no wonder that Paul had these people in his heart. He's calling back to this moment in time. He's like, man, remember those days? Oh, those are good old days. Those are good old days. It's so funny. Um, Look, something happens when, when believers serve together. When they struggle together side by side. When they make shared sacrifice in the service of Jesus, they form a special bond. And they're forever shaped by the experience. Okay, none of these people go to the church here now because this happened when they were all in college and very few of you live in the place where you went to college and that's the same thing with them. But early days of the church, I had heard that there was a group in Mexico that built houses. I just heard about it. I hadn't even talked to anybody who had ever done it. I just heard that somebody did it. We had a college pastor at the time. Her name's Meredith Jones. And um, she was a junior in college herself. And, and I was like, Meredith, I, it's summer. Like, why don't you get some college students together? Go build a house in Mexico. Why not? David told me to do it. I guess I'll do it. They drove my minivan and somebody else's minivan in the church. And, and 12 college students drove down to Mexico. I didn't even go with them. I just sent them. I was like, go do something this summer. You know, make a difference. I don't know. I've heard this is great. Go tell me about it. I mean, thinking back, it's just stupid. Like, like really dumb. <laughs> and I don't know what you, what the parents of those college students were thinking, but they're like, I guess it's just, uh, well, the pastor said to go. They're going. Twelve students. Honestly, two of them had no business being on this trip at all. Okay. And they had no idea what they're getting into. And they went down there, and, and um, those of you that have built a house in Mexico, you might have heard stories. It's like the good old days, the hard, when it was really hard. You guys got it easy. This one is really hard. Like, I hear those stories because I wasn't on the first trip either. But they didn't even know that they were supposed to mix, con- they didn't even know that they're supposed to have tools. We didn't sit down there with any tools. I, like, I don't know what we were thinking, but they came back. From a grueling experience, you know, 100 plus heat every day. Took them two days to pour this, just the foundation. Took them four more days to build the house out. They got back a day later than they were scheduled to be back. And they came back totally exhausted, totally spent. And honestly... Every time that I talk to any one of these people, that's what they talk about. And any time you get two of them together, you feel like an outsider. Because they're like, oh yeah, and then we do this. And then. I, this is what happened. They talked about it so much, those 12. Actually, only nine of them talked about it because three of them, I don't think they ever came back to the church after that. They're like, this, this place is crazy. I'm not doing this anymore. Bye-bye. You know, you're not telling me to go anywhere anymore. Um, they talked about it so much that the next year let 54 people go to Mexico. Why? Be- because, it, look, they didn't glorify it. Like in, in fact, in the second year, we're trying to talk people out of going. In that day, we camped in tents in the middle of a dust bowl field. You get a five-gallon bucket and dip it in a 50 gallon water container and you set it up in a shelf and you pour it over your head for your shower you take that same bucket and dip it and you know you flush with that that's all of this is outdoors it was disaster you cook all your own meals tent camping 100 degrees in Mexico it, it, like they almost made it harder intentionally and I thought, wow, like there's something special here that gets forged in the midst of this. There's friendships. Some of those guys, they're just lifelong friends. And it started there. It started there. Something happens when believers serve together, when they struggle together side by side, when they, they make shared sacrifice in the service of Jesus. They form a special bond. Some of you want that special bond, but you do. You want it to come without the sacrifice and serving part. And it just doesn't happen. 
That's why, you, you, that's why I need you to, to consider today. Because your resistance to that kind of commitment, to that kind of hard, high bar. Give me, give me like a serving role that's, you know, I can just kind of be there when I need to and kind of dance in, dance out, like feel good about it. I'm not minimizing any of that. I'm just saying it doesn't produce this kind of relationships. And some of your resistance to high bar commitment, high bar sacrifice, is keeping you from the very thing that your heart longs for. The depth of friendships. So see, this is what Paul's calling back. I remember this. It gets forged because you're in prison. It gets forged because you were there with the earthquake. It gets forged because you confronted the city officials. It gets, it gets forged in the, in the fire and the, the, the difficulty and the struggle. And we just want friendships without all that stuff. And the reality is it just, just doesn't happen. In fact, what happens is you think you have friendships. And then tough times come uninvited. And then there's a little scattering. It's a, it's a filtering out. And you start thinking, wow, I guess I know who's with me now versus who I thought was with me. Well, Paul in Philippians, he also mentions two other people. And I want to talk about them because they're close friendships. The first one's Timothy. And he says this about Timothy in Philippians chapter 2. He says, if the Lord Jesus is willing, <coughs> I hope to send Timothy to you soon for a visit. Then he can cheer me up by telling me how you're getting along. So Timothy's with Paul. He's writing this letter. He said, hey, I hope, I hope Timothy comes to see you so that I can hear the report back and catch up on everything that you're doing. And then he says this about this guy, Timothy. I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. This guy loves you guys in Philippi. This guy genuinely cares about how you are doing. But then look at his commentary about the others in comparison to Timothy. All the others care only for themselves, not what matters to Jesus Christ. This is the very statement where I get what I said last week about spiritual maturity. Because I'm going to combine what's just right here. Timothy exhibits a genuine care for the welfare of others. And a care for what matters to Jesus Christ. And he does that by rejecting caring for only himself. All right? And that's what spiritual maturity is, guys. Spiritual maturity is this. It's always dictated. Always dictated. By our willingness to sacrifice our own desires for the desires of others or for the interest of the kingdom. This is what spiritual maturity is. It's not knowledge. It's not memorizing Bible verses. It's not... Hours and hours and hours that you spend in prayer, though this, this should be forged out of that prayer. Spiritual maturity, the barometer, the measurement of spiritually mature people is their willingness to set aside their own desires. So that they can focus on the needs of others and the needs of the kingdom. This is all rooted in Jesus Christ. You can read the beginning part of Philippians 2. <clears throat> but this is, who, this is who this Timothy is. And Paul's like, I've seen this guy. He, he actually says this about Timothy. He says, he's proved himself like a son with his father. He has served me with preaching the good news. And you feel the depth of the friendship that Paul has with this Timothy. It's like a father-son relationship. And then a few verses later, Paul mentions this other guy, Epaphroditus. He says, meanwhile, <clears throat> I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. 
He is a true brother, a co-worker, a fellow soldier. And he was your messenger to help me in my need. Now listen, this is the situation there. <clears throat> Excuse me. When you were imprisoned in this day and age, and honestly in some developing countries now, when you're in prison, it is the responsibility of your friends and family to bring you anything that you need. To bring you food. To supply your needs. It's not like American prison where we got three meals and cable TV, all right? It's just not. And what the, this church in Philippi did when they heard that Paul was in prison in Rome, <clears throat> they said, guys, like, we got to take care of him. Who's going to take care of him? They, they said, we got to do this. They didn't say, ah, oh, Paul, I mean, he's been to a lot of cities. He's got a lot of friends. Some I, I'm sure some I'll take care of. No. All right, let's do this. Who's going to go? And this Epaphrodite is like, I'll go. I'll set aside myself. I'll interrupt my life. And I'm going to go. And he goes. And so this was their messenger to help him in the time of need. Verse 26, I'm sending him back is because he has been longing to see you and he's very distressed that you guys heard that he was ill and he certainly was ill in fact he almost died but God had mercy on him so welcome him in the Lord's love and with great joy and give him the honor that people like him deserve for he risked his life for the work of Christ so when they sent him there to take care of Paul <clears throat> somewhere in the travel or somewhere in serving Paul he almost died himself And it kind of brings up a question, like, this is the kind of thing, like, I was talking to my parents uh, a couple nights ago, and just kind of got to this point where, you know, it's easy to lead a church, and it's easy to be a part of a church that exists in a culture where there's religious freedom, okay? But I believe in, in our lifetime that that's going to change. And, it, and it's already changed over the last few years. Religious liberty is crumbling away. It is giving way to other secular priorities. And when they start bumping heads, the church is losing and religious freedom is losing too. Okay? And if you don't believe that, you're just deceived. All right? Wake up, realize what's going on. And it's intentional. All right? But it doesn't wig me out. Because let me tell you, my faith in Christ, my role as a pastor, it's not based on existing in a culture of religious freedom. The church has thrived for centuries with the absence of religious freedom. And for us, we've enjoyed this, okay? Okay. But you know, I think if there was just a little persecution that came to the church, I think about half the people that go to churches would quit going. And, and that's my first question to you. Like, it, like it's still kind of respectable to go to church. You know, ah, that's good for you, man. Okay, you know. But what if it wasn't? What if it cost you something just to show up here? you still come? What if, it, what if it didn't just cost you like friendship and respectability among your peers? What, what if it was dangerous? What, was it, what if it was illegal? Would you still, would you still do it? You see, <clears throat> I think unfortunately we have we have moved so far away from our Savior who, who suffered and died. And he was, he was crucified, he was killed, he was murdered, publicly executed. And Paul's perspective is that anytime he's suffering, like in jail, 
The reason he's singing songs in jail after he's been flogged and beaten so severely that somebody has to bandage his wounds and he's in shackles, the reason he's still praying and singing hymns and, and, and I wouldn't be, the reason he's doing that is because he understands like, that there is an invitation by God for all of his followers to enter into the fellowship of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. It's not a good little uh, come to church message. You're not going to get this at, at places that really want you to just keep showing up every week. Okay? This is one of those messages that thins the crowd. Jesus did this over and over again. Because participating and following Jesus Christ sometimes is going to I mean you have to say yes to suffering. Jesus doesn't necessarily care about your comfort as much as he does your character and your spiritual maturity. And it gets forged in times of suffering because it pushes away what's fake. And only what's true remains in those times. And Epaphroditus, he's risked his life. And, 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 you know, it's just to serve Paul. Just to take care of him while he's in prison. Not even that great assignment. I mean, like, I think I would sign it like, David, <clears throat> I need you to take the gospel to this unreached tribe in, you know, the middle of nowhere. And bring the gospel to him. And you're going to do this. And you know what? It's at great risk and it might cost you your life, but the gospel is going to advance. I, I could kind of like strap that on and sign up for that. But hey, David, would you move to, um, you know, you move to Minneapolis and take care of uh, a pastor that's in prison there? Like, or, 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 you know, it's just like not that great assignment. It's not that big PR. But that's what he does. And he risks his life. And he almost dies in the sacrifice for the welfare of somebody else. And I'm wondering, for, forget the gospel, okay? Would you just do that for a friend? I mean, is there anybody that you would go to that level of sacrifice for that's not family? You see, like our bar for servanthood and our bar for sacrifice, our appetite for it is so low. And let me tell you, one of the reasons, or just the base reason, the beginning part of the reason this is because our busyness is so high. We have zero margin in our schedule for any interruptions. We have zero margin in our life for outside, for need. And, other, and so then when need arises in our community of friends, we, we draw back rather than running toward. Because we just don't have time for it. It's messy. So here's five thoughts. And I'm going to close. Here we go. I'm, I'll, I'll, this is summary, okay? Not big points. Just So we're here for four more minutes, all right? Hang with me. <laughs> You'll have to choose in this life. You'll have to choose between caring caring for only yourself and caring about what matters to Jesus. Do not be deceived. You cannot just add Jesus to your life. Somewhere in there, it, there is a choice to be made. And you will not grow spiritually. You will not develop the, the character of Christ. You will not participate in the fellowship of His sufferings by just adding Jesus to yourself and your cares. There's coming a time in your life where God's going to put the invitation out there and you're going to be like, wow, if I do that, then I can't do this. And I really want to do this. And God's going to say, yep. David said this was going to happen. Here it is. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? 
Because listen, the things that matter to Jesus don't conveniently fit in our life all the time. Visiting prisoners in prison, it doesn't fit in anybody's schedule. Visiting the sick or those who have lost a loved one, it doesn't fit into your schedule. Caring for the poor just doesn't fit in it doesn't fit in your schedule unless we do it as a whole group. And I don't want to minimize those of you that sacrificed spring break last year to go and build houses. Like you have to fit that in your schedule. It's not just something like, hey, let's go to Mexico. We're not because we're not college students. College students, you guys can do that anytime you want, right? It's a choice. Listen, adopting kids, it doesn't fit in your family. It doesn't just fit in your schedule. You need to get that. You're going to have to choose. The second thing you have to choose about, you'll have to choose between caring for only yourself or caring for the welfare of others. Okay? You, like you can't just care for the, the, the cares of Christ and everything about yourself. You can't care for the welfare of others and care for yourself. They're, they're choices. You just don't have that capacity. If all you're doing is what, is what you can fit or add on to while you do everything else, it's not sacrifice. It's not service. It's just add-ons. Third thing, sacrificial service requires initiative. Listen, guys, I'm going to try to be really light on this, but I just don't have it in me. Here's the thing. If I have to write you a job description and how to serve, it will not be sacrificial service. It just doesn't happen. I don't write a job description that says, hey, well, this is going to require you to put your life on the line, and you might die, but it will be worth it in eternity. Anybody signing up for that one? You, you get what I'm saying here? Like, nobody is going to write something and say, hey, will you fill this volunteer spot? We write volunteer spots to make it easy. And I think sometimes we cut off what, what really God is wanting to invite you into. But listen, sacrificial, it requires initiative on your part because it's got to come from here. It can't be, it can't be, forced from outside it can't be coerced when the suffering when the tough part comes that who were those who were coerced into it they fall away it requires an if you've got to figure out like I'm I, I hate I hate to define what serving looks like because I feel like I'm cutting off a, a gigantic conversation that, that God wants to have with you not through me, not through the church. I really feel like what I could put out there and say, hey, here's all our volunteers' role. Who's going to do this? 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 <clears throat> that will cut off so much of what God wants you to do because what I would ask you to do is just this little much. And God wants to use some of you to change the world. God wants to use some of you to, to transform the future of, some, of a group of kids, a sibling group of three that are in the foster care system right now. Like God wants to use you to do so much bigger, so much better stuff than I would ever write in a three-sentence job description for you. So why would I cut that off? Why would I say, hey, just do this. See if, see if it works. Try it out for a couple weeks. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't. And if you don't, it's no big deal. Somebody else will step in. Please have a conversation with God. God has equipped you, empowered you, gifted you, created you, redeemed you, recreated you for the work that He had planned for you long ago. And I'm not going to interrupt that conversation by lowering the bar way down here. Because God wants your heart, guys. And some of you know it. Some of you feel it. Because you know God's calling you to something. You just had not had the will 
to put aside yourself to do it. And I'm just saying to you today, whatever that is, like do it. Go for it. Yeah, I know it's going to be hard. Yeah, I know it's going to be more than you thought it was to begin with. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. So let's go. And know as you go, there are others in this church who are going to. And we can look beside each other and keep running. And it'll be worth it. Fourth thing, sacrificial service builds spiritual maturity. I think I've talked about that enough. Look, don't be deceived. Spiritual maturity comes through sacrifice. Setting aside your desires for the sake of others, for the sake of the kingdom. That's where it's at. And then the last thing is, guys, you've got to watch how God binds hearts together in friendship. That can only happen in the context of sacrificial service. Some of the friendships that God wants you to have and he's prepared for you are one step away. But that step is a huge step of sacrificial service on your part. And if you'll step in deep, deep in, over your head in, you might just meet Timothy, Epaphroditus, Lydia. Who knows? But that's how God does things. So step in. Take a risk. I know it's a risk. Because there's no guarantees on the other side. It's just God's promises. Of his presence. Of his spirit. Of the community of Christ. The fellowship of suffering. Pray with me. God, I pray that you would um, build deep in the hearts of some people here this morning a, um, a passion for setting aside their own desires so that they can care for others well and that they can advance your kingdom in this community. And I pray, God, that you would um, surprise them and that they would say yes to the depth of sacrifice that it's going to require for them. And that we would encourage and support that kind of sacrifice, that kind of fellowship in the sufferings of Christ. We'd participate together. We'd spur each other on. We'd do this for your sake, trusting your promises comfort of your presence and for eternity enjoyed in a life well spent. We pray in Jesus' name.